Instead of me going to, from a break even situation, I would probably end up making about 20 grand a month or 20 grand a year. Why? Peace, Marby. Hey, what up? I'm on a Zoom with Alyssa, Allison, and Hannah. Amazing. Yeah, what's up? The team is cranking, huh? Yeah. I need. Done. You know the house on Flower we just bought? Yeah. Do you, can you give me some stats on that real fast? As far as like what it size, what we bought it for. Pur purchase pr purchase price, interest rate. Um, uh, purchase price was two seventy seven five hundred. Interest rate is two point six two five percent. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Two point six five percent. Six two five. Six two five. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, payment. PITI is 1268 and some change. Okay. And then um, rent rate is $1,800. Okay. Uh, they, we paid $25,000 to the seller and there was a $15,000 assignment plus closing costs. Okay, 25, 15, closing costs, reno. Do you want the settlement statement? No. Yeah, actually, sure. Send me the settlement statement. Maybe I'll give that away in the YouTube comments. Do you want me to uh, take our address? I mean, our address is on everything. The Broadway address. Oh, yeah, that's that's the UPS store. They can People are going to have that. Okay. Just tell them to, oh, we'll tell them to send me cool gifts. Yeah, please send us gifts. Okay. Send us things that are not perishable because we don't go there that often. Yeah, why, uh, Molly's very much into horses. Send us a horse <laughs> to our UPS store. <laughs> not through the <laughs> okay, cool. All right, talk to you later. Goodbye. All right, so today we're gonna give you guys a breakdown of a deal. This is bothering me, I don't know why. We're gonna give you a deal, a breakdown of a deal on Flower Street. This is actually part three of the video. So let's go through the full process of buying a house subject to. This will be part three, but it also will give you guys a pretty good like full flow of how this works. So here's where it starts. Every deal starts with what, Eric? What does every deal start with? A seller. A seller. Oh my gosh, it starts with a seller, somebody who owns the property that has, has what? Not just a house, but what do they have? A mortgage. Okay, I like that. That's a sub two deal, but what if they are, what if it's seller finance? They don't have a mortgage, right? They have a deed. They do have a deed. Ooh, I, I'm liking this. Eric is getting this. Okay, Eric, you got a deed, but what else do they have? In order for me to buy their house at a discount or on terms, what do they have to have? It's more of an emotional thing. I call them bunnies, all right? Or motivation. So when people are starting out in this business, they always wanna wonder, they always, where do these deals come from? And why would a seller sell to you and let you take over their 2.625, What's your interest rate on your house? 325. 325. I got one at 2.625, bro. How did I do that? The way I did it is because we focused on motivation. We'll get to that in just a second. So every deal starts with a seller. And then what typically happens is you have an agent involved. Why do you have an agent involved? Well, because most homeowners don't understand where to find investors. This seller had a lot of motivation. So let me list out his motivation. Hopefully this is really helpful. If this is helpful that I'm going really slow and I'm, I'm really breaking down all these little steps, please make a comment down below. And more importantly, please subscribe on your way down there because 80% of our viewers do not subscribe to our channel. That's not cool. And I will email you and I will give you the settlement statement of this deal so you can see what a, a final deal looks like so you know I'm not lying. Okay, I'm probably lying on the number. It's probably not 277,500, it's probably 277,512 dollars. I don't know, don't criticize me and don't ridicule me for that. I'm just gonna kind of do round numbers on this. If you click the link down below, we'll give you the settlement statement for this deal, okay? Motivation, let's go through number one. Number one is he had a um, recent job change, okay? So that's why he wanted to sell. That's a good reason or motivation to sell your property, but not a motivation to sell on sub two. He had no equity is a really big one. Why did he have no equity? Well, because he bought this property in 2021 and the, the market was trending upward and now the market is trending downward. He bought the property with a VA loan 
and he put zero dollars down when he originally bought the house. Okay, so let's look at look look at it this way. Here, I'll take a good 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 example. So I have this Raptor R. I just bought it. Okay, this is really hard to find vehicle. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you as an example. I've always had an F-150. Just I trade I traded my F-150. I sold it on seller finance. If you guys want to see that video, click the link down below. Did a video on how I sold a twenty-two thousand dollar truck for forty-seven thousand dollars, and I replaced it with this. Okay. I bought this brand new. Like somebody had to find this deal for me. Shout out to Alan who finds cars for me. Um, he's also looking for a 2023 Prius for me right now because I'm gonna upgrade my Prius. So um, when I bought this truck, do you think I have any equity in this truck? Or if I sold it today, would I have to actually lose money? Yep, you guessed it. If you buy a brand new vehicle and you drive it off the lot, that car is no longer worth what you paid for it. In fact, it's probably worth less because you paid fees and um, you paid all sorts of transportation tax and licensing and registration and all, all those things above the purchase price of the vehicle. It's the same thing with a house, okay? When you buy a house, you have all sorts of closing costs and home warranties and all these things. You buy a house over what you actually offer for it. You always pay more and the house immediately, if you sell it today, for example, let's say I buy a house today and I buy it for $300,000. And tomorrow, let's say I pay cash for it, 300 grand. Tomorrow, I wanna to turn around and sell that house for $300,000. Am I gonna get $300,000 back? No, I'm probably going to get about 260 to $275,000 for that house that I just bought for 300 and I sold for 300. So people at 300, that are selling for 300 are actually gonna lose money. That's how real estate works because you have all these people involved, lots of people that are involved in these transactions. Agent, 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 broker, um, escrow officer, title company, right? Um, inspector, home warranty, all, all sorts of expenses get taken out of that 300 grand. So if you're a homeowner, you bought the property in 2021, market was going up, now the market's going down, you didn't put any money down on the property, and now you're going to sell it through an agent. The agent failed to sell the house, okay? Because the agent, I'm, I'm gonna be really honest with you. Somebody, please send this to your best friend that's an agent. Agents don't understand the basics of this. Most of them don't, okay? 99% of agents are what I call um, undercover agents. Because they're not really agents. They don't really understand real estate. And there's about 1% of agents, I call them the unicorn realtors, okay? They do, they survive and thrive in real estate. They understand that if a homeowner bought a house for 300 today and wanted to sell it tomorrow for 300, they're writing a check and losing that. This agent that this seller hired did not tell the seller he was gonna have to write a check out of his pocket to sell the property. This just barely happened, guys. Like barely, barely just happened. So what happens is after five and a half months of trying to sell the house, one of my students, Kevin Cho, okay, Kevin Cho 12 on Instagram, shout out Kevin Cho. One of my students, Kevin Cho, I told him about a year ago, I said, start reaching out to agents um, who have listings over a hundred days or later and the agents are gonna be more motivated to do deals with you because they're having a hard time selling the house on the market. So Kevin Cho starts reaching out. We call this the Kevin Cho list. So um, purchased in 2020 to 2022, and it's currently on the MLS with an agent over 100 days, okay? The way you can get that list, by the way, is you can go to startwithprivy.com and you can get that list. So Kevin calls the list, talks to the agent. Guess what the agent says? Agent says, no, and loses the listing. So what does Kevin do? Kevin then says, well, I'm not gonna wait for you. So he calls the, the seller directly. What do you think the seller says? Seller says, yes, I'll let you take over my payments subject to, and I'll get to the process of subject to in just a second. So Kevin gets the deal, 2020 to 2022, on the MLS over 100 days, agent turns him down, says no, agent gets fired. And what's so funny about this is that, guys, if you're a real estate agent and you're not using creative finance, subject to seller finance, novation agreements, 
Tell your broker that you're leaving them and you're gonna go to a broker that is not broke, er than you, okay? That's why they call them broker. It's because they're broker than you. And they're definitely broker than me, okay? So stop working with brokers who are broker than you. They don't have any money and they're not actually buying real estate. Stop it. Okay, so you go to start with Privy, you get, the, you get a list like this. There's a thousand different lists, but this is a really, really good sub two list. I'm gonna give you the name, the type of list again. 2020 to 2022 purchased, okay? VA loan is even like a bonus. And it's on the MLS with an agent over 100 days. Do not bother agents on listings less than 100 days old. They're not gonna talk to you. Agents are proud, they think they know everything, and you should wait until the market beats them up, okay? So Kevin reaches out to the seller and explains to the seller, hey, I can take over your payments. Why is that such a big deal for the seller? Well, because the seller, remember this seller right here, for five and a half months had a vacant property because he had a recent job change out of state. So seller leaves the property vacant, to let the seller, to let the real estate agent sell the property. And for five and a half months is not only making the rent payment where he currently lives, but he's now making the payment on, of $1,268 a month at 2.265% interest, whatever it is. He's got pain and motivation here, okay? This is one of the best opportunities in all of real estate right now is expired listings. Okay, so what, what is an expired listing? Right here, an agent got fired. How many agents in the last 30 days in Maricopa County, that's where I live, Maricopa County, how many agents got fired from failing to sell a house in the last 30 days? By the way, send this to David Green on Bigger Pockets because he needs to know this. Because he, he criticized wholesale on, on one of his YouTube videos recently, and I'm not a big fan of that. So let me point out to the licensed real estate agents right now, that in Maricopa County alone, we had 600 plus homeowners fail to sell their homes because their agents did not educate them on the price of their home and what was going on in the market. And on top of that, the agents don't understand subject to and seller finance. And I'll get to this in just a second. Seller says, yeah, are, really? You would take, instead of you saying, why would a seller take, let me take over his payments subject to, look at the reasons why. He went through five and a half months of making payments, kind of changes your paradigm a little bit for you to say, go from why would a seller do it to, oh my gosh, I totally understand why a seller would do this. Do you want to make two payments a month after you just took a job change that's supposed to upgrade and um, drastically change your life in a positive way, but then just find out that you have five months of payments on a house that the seller or the agent said he could sell for you, but he couldn't? No, a lot of pain here, okay? Seller says, absolutely, I'll let you take over my house payment, but I want $25,000 is what the, the seller wanted, $25,000, okay? Here's the challenge. This house was purchased for $277,000. I would have happily paid an agent a 3% commission by representing us, but the seller got fired because he, the, the I'm sorry, the agent got fired because the agent was told, or told Kevin Cho, no. The agent told Kevin Cho, no, because the agent doesn't understand creative finance. This is the number one thing that you will run into with agents is they will not follow through with their fiduciary responsibility with their clients. Yes, if you're an agent and you're listening to me, you're a broker, you're listening to me, you are not um, fulfilling your obligation working with your seller if you are not presenting all offers to your seller. And what's gonna happen, this is happening two, three times a week for me, just me. My portfolio is growing two, three, four times, or two, three, four houses a week. And the majority of the deals that we're getting right now are expired listings because agents failed to utilize creative finance because they don't understand it, because their broker, who's broker than anybody I know, I don't know any wealthy brokers. Do you know any wealthy brokers? Eric says no. I don't know any, yeah, there you go. Well, I, I don't know any wealthy brokers unless they own real estate themselves. So if you're an agent and you're like, damn, you're right, Pace, like I don't understand creative finance. Well, first off, why don't you? I'm explaining the process to you. Secondly, switch over to a different broker that is not broker than you. Go to a broker who has real estate and invests and understands these things. Okay, so this is the pain and the motivation. These are the bunnies that the seller is experiencing. The seller, 
I actually, dude, do we have that? Remember when I called the agent or the seller with Kevin Cho in front of the house? We're gonna cut to that recording for just like 45 seconds. You can hear me ask the seller, what was the process like with subject two? Cut now. Guys, we're calling a seller right now that we just bought this house from. Hi, hey Joe, my, my name's Pace, I'm, I'm Kevin's partner. I just wanna call and thank you for the house, brother, and just, and just say how much we appreciate you for doing business with us. Oh, no problem. How, how did the process go? How did our team treat you? How did the title company treat you? All that stuff. Well, if we could have gotten everything, if we could have gotten the, gotten it off the market when it was supposed to be. Yeah, but that that was the agent, right? Yeah. How how what where why didn't that agent present this type of like creative offer to you? Did they not know how to do it? I I don't know what it what his, what his problem was. He wanted money. He wanted to get paid for doing nothing. Yeah, typical agent, man. Well, we're happy, we're happy it got all done. We're here at the property. We're gonna start uh, getting it all cleaned up. Just wanted to say thank you again for doing business with us. I taught Kevin how to do all these kind of real estate strategies. How did he do? How did, When he explained subject two to you, how did he do? He did good. All right, we're back. So hopefully that was helpful for you guys to see this is real. This isn't just some story I'm telling you. It is a real story with a seller. So let's talk about the numbers on this. Let's break down the financial break. Did, did I explain this? properly? Did I do a good job? Is somebody gonna go, you didn't break it down enough for me. You didn't explain it enough. How dare you spend all this time and energy on your YouTube channel and not explain anything to me. You just waste, you just did a bunch of blah, 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 blah. As you saw Molly, give me the numbers. Let's break down the numbers and how I'm gonna make money. I gave you the lead type, okay? Um, Kevin came in and the agent gets fired, so no more agent. Sorry, agent, you missed out on roughly $8,000 in commissions you could have made, but you are not learning and expanding and growing and, uh, and truly, truly understanding real, uh, real estate. So agent gets fired, Kevin gets involved. Okay, Kevin is one of my young students. He's 22 years old. This year, Kevin will probably make $600,000. Okay, just assigning, wholesaling a subject to deal. So here's how subject to works. Kevin takes one of our contracts that he gets from my mentorship. Yes, I have a mentorship. No, I'm not trying to sell you. I'm just telling you where he got stuff. Takes a contract. He has a transaction coordinator, somebody from my mentorship. No, I'm not trying to sell you on a mentorship. I'm just letting you know where these resources are located. He hires a transaction coordinator. Transaction coordinator calls the seller walks the seller through the sub two paperwork. Yes, it's a, a separate contract. I know I will never give you a sub two or seller finance contract. I see Jerry Norton giving his away. Go get his, okay? Mine are private. I do so many transactions, subject sub two and seller finance. They change so frequently. I only give them to my students. So if you want a sub two or seller finance transaction uh, or a purchase contract, go to my students, okay? Or go hire your own attorney. It'll cost you at least ten to twelve thousand dollars to get a proper contract written with the proper disclosures. This purchase contract, a sub two contract, okay. You have a purchase contract, and then you have seven other documents, okay. It is not just a purchase contract. There are seven other documents attached to this that all need to be signed, okay. So this purchase contract then gets sent over to where does it go, Eric? Title. title company. Okay, so the girls inside the title company, they receive the paperwork and then they call the seller and they go, hey seller, we see there's a purchase contract, just want to verify that you're in contract with Kevin Cho and his team. Seller says yes. They have now officially opened escrow, okay? Here's what happens in sub two. This is where sub two is very, it's so much, I'm telling you, listen to me. Cash transactions are so much more challenging than sub two. You guys think sub two is more challenging? Sub two is way, way, way easier. I can close a sub two deal in two to three days max, okay? If I have a lender involved, which we're not getting a lender involved, we're just taking over payments here, okay? The deed, okay, the certificate of ownership, the title company is transferring that to the end buyer. So Kevin Cho, my student, assigns this contract to me, okay? That assignment contract also goes to the title. So the deed goes to the title, the purchase contract goes to the title, this assignment contract goes to the title, and the title company cooks up and works up the entire purchase contract. Okay? Or not the purchase contract, but the whole transaction. 
Their job is for me, the buyer, to take all my money and I wire it to close it, I wire it to the title company. Out of the, my money that gets wired, let's, let's add up what it is, 25 grand, 15 grand, five grand, so 45, so $55,000 is what it took to get this deal done. I wire $55,000 to the title company. Where does that 55 grand come from, Eric? Private money. Private money. So let's break that down too. Somebody's gonna say, I need to start to finish. I need to, you please tell me the whole start to finish. And they're gonna criticize me for not, and then they're gonna say some shit like, this video is too long. Man, start your day with gratitude. And by the way, click the subscribe button. Show me some gratitude, please. Okay, so I go find a private money lender. You guys have seen my private money lenders, in fact, in video number one and video number two, Wesley Grant underscore 21 is one of my private money lenders I go to for money like this. So private money lender, where do I find private money? Go in the link in the description down below. I have a whole private money training free on YouTube just for you, okay? Private money, where do you find it? Link. Private money gives, do they give me the money, Eric? No. Where does the money go? Title. Title, does the private money letter ever wire money to me? No, so that money only goes to title. And the agreement that I have with that private money lender is called a note and a deed of trust, okay? Which is a mortgage in Arizona. So I have an agreement between me and my private money lender. That agreement for me is 8% interest only. Let's do 8% interest only. I would say the payment's probably like 425, something like that. You think you're faster than me? <laughs> Don't even try it. Eric's trying to do it faster than me right now, guys. He's so full of it. Okay, 4,400 4, divided by, okay, so my payment, guess the payment. Monthly. 1,500. 1,500, are you kidding me? It's 366 bucks. Oh, then I have to put the mortgage, my bad. Okay, so $366, I'm gonna borrow the 55 grand at $366 a month. The title company sets up my agreement, they set up servicing, they set everything up, they pull the money out of my bank account in the future, everything's automated, okay? The person who does all of that is the title company and the transaction coordinator, okay? I can see why real estate is complicated for people. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of people involved making a lot of money. Okay, so who gets paid? Well, here's what happens. Once my money hits the title company, 55 grand, they decide, hey, we're ready to close escrow. All right, so what ends up happening, the title company receives my $55,000, okay? They receive the 55,000. Then the title company wires 25 grand to the seller, they wire $15,000 to Kevin. They wire, uh, they take $5,000 for their closing costs. And then I keep $10,000 in their um, escrow account for future renovations. So my $55,000 did not come from me. I'm $0 out of pocket. The deed or the ownership, the title company makes sure it's put into my name, okay? So Pace is now the owner of the property and the payments are coming out of my bank account and paying for this $1,268 payment plus my $366 payment every single month, okay? Now, you have questions, make a comment down below. I'm trying to go fast because Eric's trying, and we got a super duty guy trying to back into us. I don't know what's going on over here. Now, I own the property. Here's the house, okay? The house, the $10,000 is gonna go and renovate the property. I'm then going to continue to have a $1,268 monthly payment, and then we're gonna have a $366 monthly payment. Where does that go, Eric? Kevin. That goes to private money lender. Why would that go to Kevin? Because uh, Kevin's a great guy. Kevin's been paid 100%. Kevin has been paid, all right? Um, so Kevin's been paid his $15,000. He's out of the transaction. He has signed the deal. He's gone. Make sense? You, now you've shocked me. You've shocked me, Eric. Okay, so $1,268 monthly payment. Where does that go? Goes to the loan. Goes towards the loan. It's one of those obvious questions where you're like, wait, is this a trick question? Okay, so uh, goes towards the loan that I just took over subject to, right? Who's the owner of the property? You. Me. Whose name is on the loan? The seller. Seller. 
perfect. So I know I have a payment every single month of 15, let's just say it's uh, 1,500, 1,600, let's say it's 1,650 bucks, okay? I don't care about the math being perfect. Some engineer is losing his mind right now. So you heard what Molly said, right? Molly said in the very beginning, she says, we know we can rent this house right now for $1,800 a month. Okay, cool. So I'm into the deal, no money. My private money lender is making 366 per month. My loan pay down is happening right now. Okay, so this is what we, I call the Delta, 277,500. Right now, the house has no equity. I bought, basically bought it for 277,500 plus 55 grand. I paid $55,000 over what this property could not sell for. Does that make sense? I paid 15 grand to Kevin, 25 grand to the seller. I didn't buy the house. That's the thing that people don't understand about subject two. I didn't buy the house. Yes, technically I did, but really what I bought is this, 2.625% interest. That's what I really bought. That's what I cared about. The value of that will far outweigh what I paid in renovation and assignment fees on this house. So this is what I owe today. Here's what's great is over time, this will pay down to let's say in 10 years, I'll owe $180,000 on this. Well, guess what? In 10 years, this property will also be worth $425,000. And this is called the Delta, okay? This is how real estate investors make money, okay? Yes, cash flow is cool. And yes, I can cash flow, which I'll get to that in a second. But really what I care about is the future Delta. Well, this is where wealth is, okay? This is where I have a silent savings account. Now, Eric, if I rent this property today for 1,600, or I, I have a total payment of $1,650 a month, and I rent this for $1,800 a month, do I have a net cash flow of $150 per month? No. No, why not? We call, we call this CapEx, or we call this the um, vacancy and repairs. So think about, Think about if in one month, let's say I rent this property out for 12 months, right? So I've got January, February, March, April, May, June, 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 all the way to December. And I have a tenant all the way through here, okay? $150 a month equals $1,800, ironically. I did not mean for it to do that, but that means $1,800, right? In cash flow, $150 I'm making every single month. If January comes and that tenant moves out and I can't get a tenant back in there until February, did I actually make any net cash flow for the last 12 months? No, this $1,800 actually now has to go back and pay these payments. I didn't really make any cash flow. So that is not a great cash flowing property. It's more of a break even property, okay? Especially what happens if in a year I have carpet, I have a new air conditioning unit, I have roofing repairs, I have all that kind of stuff. I wanna make sure I'm cash flowing four or $500 every single month. So what can I do to make more money here, Eric? Cash out refi. No, I would never do a cash out refi. Oh, yeah, Why would I get rid of that? True. That's my prize joy, I would never get rid of that. So what would I, what would I do different than maybe a rental? A different type of rental. Uh, different exit strategy, right? So if I'm not gonna be able to, I can, if I can break even on a rental, I'll buy the deal, which is, this is kind of a break even. I would change my exit strategy to maybe a lease option. We, know, we don't talk about lease options as much as I used to. I used to do a lot of those. I could do it on a wrap. If I did it on a wrap, I would not need to spend the $10,000 to renovate the property, which is kind of cool, okay? Um, that's a whole nother conversation for another day, sorry. What's another, what's another strategy I could do? I could do Airbnb, right? I could do, um, what else? Midterm rental, I could do sober living or let's just say group homes, corporate rental or insurance rentals. Yeah, there, there you go. So I can amplify my cash flow on this deal. Let's say I do a group home. This, this property will bring in about $5,500 a month on a group home. Lease option, instead of it being 1,800, I'd probably get 2,100. Um, on a wrap, I could get 2,100 as well. Uh, corporate and insurance probably get closer to like $4,000. Airbnb, 3,500. Midterm rental, probably 3,500. So you can make more money on these strategies, all right? 
How do you determine which strategy to use? Well, it depends on what resources, what relationships, what, what your passions are. Personally, I'm not a big fan of group homes unless I have somebody to operate them for me. So that's a good example of, do I have a resource to rent this out? I have a guy named Patrick that every time I get a house like this, I call Patrick and I go, do you want this as a group home? And if he says yes, I rent it out to him. I sublease it for double my average payment. So he could bring in 5,500, but I would take my $1,800 rent rate and double it to him. So I'd bring in about 3,600 bucks a month. I'd make a really good amount of money, all right? Instead of me going from a break even situation, I would probably end up making about 20 grand a month or 20 grand a year. Why? Because $1,800, that's what I could rent it for. I would double that and I would give it to Patrick, okay? So now I'm cash flowing $1,800 a month instead of $150 a month. Multiply that by 12, you're gonna be somewhere around $20,000. That makes a lot more sense, right? In the long term. But what if you're one of these people that's buying a lot of properties and you can't find enough people to rent them out from the group home or Airbnb? There's a lot of da up positives and negatives of each exit strategy and you have to make a determination. So um, if you guys want, and you guys wanna learn exit strategies, Go to Wealth Without Cash, okay? Wealth Without Cash, uh, biggerpockets.com forward slash Wealth Without Cash. I have a whole hour, maybe two hour breakdown in this book about exit strategies, the pros, the cons, et cetera. And it's actually, that's actually not in the book. The real value of this book, guys, I'm gonna be honest with you, is the video companion guide. I broke down each chapter, gave about two hours about um, each chapter in this book in a video companion guide. Go check that out, Wealth Without Cash um, on Bigger Pockets. Go to biggerpockets.com forward slash wealth without cash. So was this in depth enough? Almost to the point where it's probably too fast. Like I probably need to dumb it down even more and I need to make it slower like this then actually, no, I did a damn good job. If I did a damn good job, then tell me in the comments down below. We'll see you in the next video.